Hi, Troop 491. My name is Shannon Reed, and I've recently graduated from the troop. I used to work with Advancement and definitely with Iron Man for many years. My son, Ethan Reed, crossed over back in fifth grade, and he's now graduating from MHS, and he eagled in 2018. So proud that he did that. He worked really hard on the front end and he was able to get his eagle at age 16. So if I could just uh, encourage you on one thing, put in the work, put in the time on the front end, it will be so worth it. I can't tell you how proud I am of seeing how all of that effort and work and investment has paid off already for Ethan in particular. You know, he just recently got accepted to A&M in the School of Engineering, and I am positive that it had so much to do with seeing his Eagle Scout record right there on his resume, and it is worth it, guys. And parents, just an encouragement to you, I, I've got to tell you, invest. Just plan on Monday night being scout night. Be at the hut. Be excited. This will become your family. I love all of the people that I have come to know and work with and spend Monday nights with for so many years. They're family. And I know that you are going to get so much out of this and your scout too. So just a little aside, thanks for letting me share that. It's been on my heart to say hello and just welcome to 491 and be all in and you're going to get so much out of it. Okay, enough of that. I just wanted to take a minute and visit with you about Iron Man. So I know that Mary was sharing with you um, for those who were in attendance recently at the Scout Hut, but that's so much to take in. I thought that doing a video with my slideshow might help you to digest everything that we're doing for this event. You know, it takes a lot of money to take care of all of the events and activities, campouts, everything that we do. And I am thankful for having activities like Ironman where the boys and families can come and learn so much besides just asking for money that they're able to learn skills and work together. It will be such a fun time for you to get to know and build relationships with the other families in our troop as well. And you'll build lots of memories. It'll be great. You'll love it. One of the extra things that I'm so proud of in the Ironman uh, organization is their grants that they provide to local organizations. And I've got to tell you, Troop 40, 491 has been the recipient over the years of over $15,000. I mean, that's incredible. And we've really been able to take care of our facility needs and a lot of logistics for our troop to be just as special as it is. And in the process, we've done a phenomenal job as a troop being a volunteer group that we have held first place in our volunteer, out of all of the volunteers, we've been the first place station for the last couple of years of the event here in our race. So that's a really great reputation that we want to maintain and continue. So um, just a few exciting things on that end. All right, well, let me turn on my screen share and I'm gonna take a look at this event and help talk you through it. Of course, I will always be available if you have more questions. And I am working alongside Mary to make sure that we have our section leaders in place and to help you all find a right fit into this year's um, lineup for volunteer positions. Now we don't have the luxury of all the veterans running the top level and all of our newbies just squeezing in the bottom. You know, we have plenty of turnover that happens regularly throughout our troop. And with so many in the process of eagling 
very soon. It's going to be important that you guys step up and carry the torch well into the future. I hear a word that there's a strong possibility that Iron Man has been given the thumbs up for another five years. There were a lot of factors involved in that, um, but we're excited to know that there's a very strong potential and that it'll stay going down the hardy just like it is. So now that we know how to operate that aid station, we can keep up our great work and just continue to fine tune. OK, all right. Well, make sure that you have your calendar set for Saturday, April 24th. And really, there is no way to add an extra shift. It's all come all the whole session and we will give breaks and rotations within the morning. Um, as we go through our event, because by the time we brought in a second shift, the bulk of the race would be over at that point. And the scouts from the morning might not hardly experience any of the race. So it all just works out if we all commit and we'll rotate our workforce during the day internally. So let's start by looking at the course itself. So obviously the racers will swim inside the woodlands, get out of the water near the library, and they will hop onto their bikes in transition there, ride through the woodlands and head south until they can jump safely over to the Hardy Toll Road. And they're going to take the Hardy <clears throat> all the way down to us, the very last station before they hit Loop 610 interchange. And so you see, I've blown that up here, and we are bike station four, but also we will be number eight because the racers will hit the end before they get to 610, do a U turn travel all the way back up to the woodlands, turn around again, head south back to us for the second time, do that U-turn again and go back up into the woodlands, exit their bikes in transition and then start their marathon run to the finish line. When we finish our section, we are totally done for the day. So you might want to hop in your car. You still got your volunteer stuff, your scout shirt, whatever the case may be. Go down to the woodlands and see the race finish line. It is inspirational to say the least. It's just exhilarating. So you should, you should take a chance to go and see what that is all about. It's incredible. I really encourage you. Okay, now let's take a look at how do you as a volunteer get to our station? Well, the Hardy is going to be closed from early wee hours of the morning. You cannot take that down to our station. So you'll travel south on I-45 and just before you get to the Loop 610 interchange, you're going to exit cross timbers and you'll travel east until you reach the Hardy Toll Road, okay? When you're sitting at that intersection and you can see the Hardy above your head, you're gonna turn onto Hardy Street. Now, it, at that moment, the street you will notice ahead of you goes under the freeway and off to the east and into downtown. But you're going to stay over to the right hand side and look for the entrance ramp that will take you on to the toll road. Now, it will be obvious because there will be officers in police cars with their lights glaring to blockade anyone from turning on there. The only way that you'll get past the police is to have your Iron Man volunteer window sticker available. And I would love to say that I already have those, but I typically don't get them until the last minute. So there may be some logistics of me con contacting you or Mary or Heather or someone within the troop that we will get connected to you and have those passes available at the last minute, at least by Friday night before we have the event on Saturday morning so that you can get in. 
At this point, I would also encourage you about talking to other families, possibly about carpooling together. That will make it less congested as you come onto the entrance ramp and park. But there is plenty of space. It's just going to make that walk to our space a little bit longer if we have to park all of us in single file all the way down. And then our station is actually located on the four lanes of traffic of the Hardy. So let's take a look at the overview of our station. So just before our station, they're coming over the hill of an overpass above cross timbers. So they're going to coast down into our station, kind of in the bottom of a well. Now, that's not ideal for Ironman racers, but this has been now three years that we've done this. So they're pretty used to it, unless this is a first event for one of them. Um, as they come down that hill, you're going to see, of course, that our cars will be off on the side at the entrance ramp and not mingled into the space of our, uh, our bike aid station at all. And then we will set up our canopies to deliver product in this blue circle area. And then just shortly after our station, the road will level off and start to incline as it approaches Loop 610. That's when the bikes will have to slow down they're gonna make that U-turn and they are going to stay on our side of the divider wall and head back north until they come and see us a second time. Now you'll notice here that we have trash targets. This is a fun little addition that we brought to our station that many of the racers look forward to. If you can imagine 112 miles of concrete nothing, hard wind blowing, very, very boring. It's fun to wake up the brain, have a little target practice, throwing their bottles and empty trash into our soccer goals. Well, it's fun for them, but it's also very good logistics for us as we contain the trash. Because at the end of this day, we have to absolutely leave no trace. And I'm telling you, Houston sends in their garbage trucks and they are breathing down our necks to be gone. And they're going to scoop up all that trash and we have to disappear like we never were there. So containing that trash is a win, win, win for us and a lot of fun for the racers. So we have three soccer goals in storage just for that purpose. All right, now I wanna show you a street view of what our space literally looks like on the day of the event. So you can see way over here to the right, the concrete divider wall and all of the northbound traffic is still happening on the other side of the wall. We will not encounter that at all, no vehicles on our side. And besides the shoulder, you'll notice there are four physical lanes of traffic. And on the outside, there is a shoulder that is wide enough for a vehicle to pass through if an emergency were to occur. Notice here on the outside, there's another concrete divider wall. Well, this section starts a slight incline going as you approach the 610 interchange. And the challenge is how steep it goes over the other end um, as you look over that wall. Now there's vegetation here, but sometimes those get clipped back by the time we have our event. But we just need to be very mindful of safety. Now I have heard the request in question about siblings joining us to work. Now we want as many able bodies that can work as possible. So friends and aunts and uncles and cousins and sisters and brothers and all of the rest are all welcome to be a part of our crew. However, if we've got little, little ones 
this is probably not the space where we can safely contain them. If they're gonna be super active, there's just nowhere to go that is safe. We've got racers in front of us, we've got potential dangers behind us, and we have a cliff over the edge of that concrete wall. So we want people that can take care and be mindful in all those spaces. So I just encourage parents, either it's a sitter kind of a day for little ones, or maybe parents will divide and conquer and one stays with the little ones while the other comes to help out. Um, whatever the case may be, we just encourage you, we want to stay safe. This is a grueling hard day, um, but we do it with a smile and have fun. There's just no place for the babies to go. Okay, so I just want to be really clear about that because we want safety first. All right, so let's talk about our four lanes of and five, if you count our shoulder, of what that's really going to look like. And I have a drawing here that I think will explain it best. So we've got our concrete divider way over here to the right. And in that last lane, inside lane of traffic is where our racers will go back up north and we will not touch them or encounter them. We will not serve them water or solve a problem over there because there's danger to cross this lane for the existing racers. Now there are protocols for emergencies, don't worry, but that won't be your job. And so you just wanna take care of serving products to the racers that are southbound. So they will be in the second lane headed south and they will have their right hand closest to us. We will be in the center lane or the third lane of traffic and we will be using the white canopies from the scout hut and I have additional white canopies that we'll use to create extra shade simply because it is a hot hard day if you don't have shade. So we're going to have as many canopies to create a little city right here in our middle lane. Now when they come down that hill they will encounter the products in a particular order. And this is required by Iron Man. We will have water up front, Gatorade or Powerade, depending on who is the sponsor. Then we will have some sort of food, a banana usually, some gels, some bars, all kinds of assorted products in the center. Then we will have our Gatorade again and finish it off with water. So those are the five expected stations that the racers are used to. But we always add a bonus because we want to go above and beyond. And so we have created an extra station that has a variety of needs to be met. We have some bike tools. We have some other specialty products that maybe they need. Racers have told me personally that they have so appreciated a Coke when they're at mile 40 or 80. Sometimes it's a strange request, but we have done so, so many things a little above and beyond, and they have been greatly appreciated by all of those racers. There will also be a series of porta potties down there and we will have all of the feminine products and other medically related products down at that end. Just beyond our sixth area will be a medical tent and that will be powered by their medical sponsor for the Ironman race. And that medical team will be there with their radios on and in communications. So we're thankful to have a medical team on site um, to handle any specific emergencies there. Now behind all of those product tents will be our break area tent and our working space for Troop 491. This is our movable area to replenish and restock and move back and forth through these six areas without getting in the way of the racers. 
And our product truck will set the tone for that. When we drive up with the product truck, we will go to the farthest end and open our long ramp so that our product leader will be able to manage getting all of the products you need to your locations. All right, and then the shoulder of the road must stay clear so that emergency crews and medical crews and teams and Ironman teams can drive safely behind us. So this is not a collection area for trash or dumping any of our pallets or our junk back there. We have to be very self-contained so that they can travel behind us safely, okay? Now that means that whenever we're doing any sort of movement that requires us to cross the shoulder, we need to have our heads on a swivel. So in case any of those emergency vehicles are coming our way, we're, we have a heads up and can see around this product truck, around our brake tents and so forth, okay? All right, let's talk about what each section actually looks like. So here we have at the top, our racer headed southbound with their right hand toward us. And this square represents our product tent, whether it's water, Gatorade, food or gels, it does not matter. We will use, instead of weights, we will use the cases of water and product to anchor down our tents. That's just the easiest way. Um, and you can put them right on the feet of the tent, the canopy, and it will hold it down securely. Then we will have multiple coolers at every station. This is so that when we take a hot bottle of product, we can begin to cool the temperature down and rotate that product forward to a cooler bucket. Now, in theory, this is a great idea. The challenge is when we really pack in the racers, we tend to get hot product going. So we need to appreciate on the front end, getting all of the temperature down on as much product as we can for regulating the amount of racers we will experience for the day. Now, having done this for many, many years, I will be working with our product truck about how much product to actually open. Because once we've opened a seal, there is no turning back. They really, Iron Man really doesn't want the product back. And we'll be able to take lots of product home at the end of this event, uh, whether it's water or uh, Gatorade or Powerade, whatever the case may be. But once you've broken the seals, then that makes that product turn on the timer for going bad, especially the Gatorade and the Powerade. And then on the water side, if you're breaking off the lids, then you have a, no longer a way to keep it closed. And that kind of gets gross. So we're going to regulate how much product we're opening. But the challenge is getting it temperature controlled and only work out of one cooler at a time so that you can get the cold product to the racer as much as possible, okay? So whoever is in charge of your station will be overseeing that product kind of distribution so that we can make sure that it gets the coldest to the racer. Now notice that we have our handoff workers up at the front lines and each of those workers will have a five gallon bucket. Now, one of the challenges that I'm learning about for this year's race is that they don't want a cycle, a constant cycle of too many handoff touches to a racer. They wanna limit the touch point opportunities to the racers. And we've struggled with this over the years all of the scouts want to be on the front lines and have a turn at the handoffs. We understand that, but it gets too crowded and the handoffs are dropped because we can't get a good, clear connection with our racers. So we must, must, must 
limit the number of people on the front lines in order to get product. Now that seems like a challenge when you only have four people delivering water at the front lines, but don't worry, there's water at the end of the line. And then we have extra water after that. So there are plenty of opportunities for them to get the products they need before they leave our station. That won't be an issue, but we absolutely must follow the protocols for Ironman and if I can emphasize this even greater, we will be in our class B Boy Scout uniform. So if a racer sees that we are not following protocol, it will be very clear to them which Boy Scout troop was in violation. We don't want to bring Iron Man or our troop any issues there. We want to do it by the book and lead by example. And I know that we'll be able to do that. So section leaders will have to be very vigilant to make sure that we put a handoff person at a bucket and then the rest of the team is just replenishing those buckets and that handoff is not moving. They're gonna stay in place and do those handoffs until they're tired and need a break. And then we'll swap those guys out and rotate that way, okay? All right, so those buckets will design where to stand and that's how much range of motion you will have for your team, okay? That's what those buckets should define for us. The rest of the people in your section are going to be prepping bottles and refilling those five gallon buckets and collecting the trash. And let me tell you, the whole experience is nonstop. You are constantly breaking seals and prepping bottles and refilling buckets and picking up trash and start all over, right? So that's gonna happen once we see racers all the way through to the end of the day, okay? We will have some trash areas set up at each section and we will have a way for us to communicate to one another. We've tried our walkie talkies in the past and I've gotta be honest, they haven't been super effective. So probably we will limit walkie talkies to our front end and back end um, extremities because they're the farthest ones away from us and our five or six tenths in the middle, we're just going to manually communicate there internally, okay? Now, we're going to put an extra canopy at each of these stations so that as you are working with your group here, you can rotate and have a seat and break right here with your own team. You won't have to leave and go far away. We're going to have a break tent for lunch where you can come over and eat in a rotation um, section leaders will be in charge of making sure that people come over and get some food and take a rotation off of the front lines as well. Um, but uh, we will have lots of space there for you to actually sit. So every person should bring their camping chair and keep it with them until they get at their final landing spot of a station and you will have a place there that you can put and park your camping chair so that you can have a rest and a break during the course of the day. It is our goal to fill our station with 65 volunteers. And I know that we can do that. When we do, then no one is going to be completely wiped out from the day. It'll be very manageable because you're going to have plenty of people to help rotate through the cycle. Okay, so that's why we definitely want to fill all of those spots. Okay, I think that covers just about everything that we need here at our station. We did have some station leaders enjoy a table so that they could put a case of water, a case of Gatorade up on the table and do it from a standing position. That is fine. We will pack some tables to come with us, 
uh, for the event and you'll be able to set up a station. I do not want to see a table across the front because you'll find out quickly that that is in your way and you need to have free reach and access out of the front end. So maybe a table will go on the side or on the back or in the middle, but you wanna leave the front end very free for travel, okay? All right. Let's take a look at the schedule so that you understand the racers experience a little more and how we will be impacted at our area. So they're going to jump in the water at 630 and I'm talking about professionals going first and then they go as they have registration by class and and maybe skill level and things like that so that the fastest racers will be up front and out of the way of the amateurs and they get out of the water and jump on the bike and believe it or not they are already our lead racer first place person should be to us about 8 30 in the morning we're gonna use this two hour window to get our bike aid mini city all set up so we have a two hour time frame to be ready for the first racer now just so you'll know what we experience with racer number one and maybe number two and number three we're going to see them fly by us grab one water at about 40 miles an hour and be gone they're going to do their u-turn and head back up they probably don't need anything else from us so that very first racer it's crucial if they're going to take a water that we have a good handoff for that first person or first two or three those professionals are going at such a top rate of speed, but they are used to working with volunteers. So we will work on our technique in the scout hut before race day so you can get a shot at trying to do the handoffs. It'll be all right, everybody will be fine, but we're gonna put a veteran for that very first racer, okay? So that we can ensure a very good handoff to start the day. Now, as the morning proceeds, you're gonna see some very good racers in packs and bunches, and then they will taper off to the less experienced. And the last racer is known as the turtle. There are time markers within the race when they wait for a turtle to pass a certain milestone and we are one of those that they have to pass us by a certain amount of time or they will be cut off from completing the race things like that uh, but there is a window of time here in this yellow circle where the first racer has already made it back around to us before the last racer has even crossed us for the first time. This is totally um, natural. We see this every year. And this little window is quite interesting. It's a bit of chaos. These guys on lap one are going pretty slow. And these guys are boogieing for finishing the race in the top echelon. So we're going to be in a window of challenge where it's the heaviest between 1030 and 1130. Thank goodness we will have lunch arrive shortly in this window. And so we'll be able to kind of get a resurge and get ready with more energy as we finish strong. Now, what's interesting about this last portion of the racers that I've noticed over the years, it isn't so much that there's a lot of people, but they begin to have a lot more needs. So we want to be as efficient as possible for these racers because they really want to get the best time they possibly can. And we don't want to be the reason that they're slowing down. But these racers will sometimes stop at a station. They'll need a water, but they'll ask, do you have a banana? Do you have a Coke? 
Do you have something else? But they stopped at the wrong spot. That's okay. You know what? We're going to solve every problem they have as quick as we can. So when you see a racer that's in distress and needs some help, we don't want to touch them in this COVID year race. We want to be as touchless as possible, but if we can help solve their needs, we will do the very best we can, getting them a water, getting them a Powerade, a Gatorade, a banana, a gel. If we have to hustle for them, all the better. Okay, so that's really what we begin to see is our hustle steps up right in this area of the second lap on our slower racers. Now, when we get down to our last two hours of the event, we will really see a taper off of the amount of racers left. Some of them will have dropped out and their bikes will have been picked up and they will have been taken back to the woodlands. Um, there may be other reasons that they don't finish or they miss a mile marker according to Ironman and they're required to step off the race. All of those things can happen and we're gonna really see those numbers of people dwindle down quickly. So what we will do at that point is consolidate our stations so that we have less space and less ground to cover. We start cleaning up all of that extra trash. We consolidate all of our canopies we're not using. We get down to a very small area and then we can get out of town quickly at the very end. Now they're going to give us a time marker when the last racer must cross us. In 2019, there were lined up along the wall about 20 racers who were not allowed to finish because they didn't cross us in time and it was about 3.30. We did our total cleanup and then they put all of those bicycles in the back of our product truck and all of the racers grabbed a ride with the Ironman staff and were shuttled back to the woodlands. Things like that may happen, but it is all hands on deck because all of the garbage trucks from Houston were lined up in a row like they were going to do a clean sweep and we had to be completely gone. The only thing left on the side of the road were the garbage bags that we had all bundled and tied and no stray trash on the ground. All of our canopies had to be packed up and we had to leave. Now the exit process we did was we brought all of our vehicles onto the freeway. We drove to the cross timbers exit and you turned and came down the exit correctly. And then we left off of cross timbers back to I-45. It was really simple to make that one block back and you turn to use the exit so much safer for us that way, right? Okay, so that kind of gives you the overview of the race day itself. And we will incorporate, as we place you in positions, we'll give everyone a home base and then we will have a trash leader who will designate a trash person from each station to do a shift of trash at the front of the race or at the end. And then we'll rotate that trash from within so that everyone has an opportunity to work on product, to work on handoffs and to work on trash and it will all take care of itself by the end of that. So I hope that this little video has helped you um, to know about the event. And I have at the end of my slideshow, uh, a few more notes. We will have to wear our masks. I don't think that Iron Man is going to honor that Texas is free and open. I think that because we have international racers and we have people from all over the United States, we want to be mindful of the audience we're working with. 
And again, we will have on our red Class B t-shirt for the day. So we want to make sure that we represent Troop 491 well and that we also represent Iron Man well. Um, because I think that if there were a concern or complaint, it'd be very easy for them to identify us. And we want to be on our game and lead by example. So yes, we will have um, masks and face shields and we will have gloves if we are touching a racer. Um, so I will learn more details about that as we grow closer and see what else um, we need to do on our end to prepare for that. Another thing that I want you to think about in advance is if you have special dietary needs, we will secure lunch and a late afternoon snack, but please already come fed. And if you have special dietary needs, make sure that you bring the things that you need so that we don't have to try and manage a menu that covers all the bases, okay? We're going to take care of some Subway sandwiches and some Chick-fil-A and um, maybe throw in some sweet tea there at the end of the afternoon just to give you a pump up. But we will have access to all of that product um, that we can consume as well. Water and Gatorade, there'll be plenty of that. And you will be able to take some product home with you. So already make plans. If you uh, would like to have some of that bottled water and Gatorade, that that will be available to you as well. Okay. Um, another thing that you can be thinking about is some of the big items that we could really use help with. We need lots of large, large ice chests. So if you have some additional ice chests that would help us um, in this process for uh, Iron Man, that would be greatly appreciated. Ones on wheels would be even better, um, but we will use the ones from the Scout Hut, but it would always be helpful if we have more. If it is a toasty day. Being on the concrete can get rough. So we may be looking for some generators and some shop fans. Let's be thinking ahead. If you have a generator and or a shop fan, it might be really nice to keep mosquitoes and bugs away, keep the air circulating and help people to cool down in case it is a little bit hotter than we would hope for because we're going to be working on the pavement. If you have any soft side wagons, those would be very helpful as we haul our trash bags around. Think about this as we're collecting all of this uh, trash that can get kind of heavy over time. If you drag it on the ground, you're just going to tear a hole in the bottom and we'll lose bottles out the bottom. What a mess. So putting all of those filled bags inside the um, soft side wagons and hauling those to one central location to dump all our trash would be a really, really smart idea. Okay, so if you have soft side wagons, that would help. Dollies would be incredibly helpful to get our product off of the product truck and to each of the stations that are needed, as well as um, ice bags, if we need to get those hauled to a particular station or tent or canopy, that would be helpful as well. So just be thinking about these items if you have them available. Now at the troop, we do have a speaker system um, that we can plug in. We want to bring some music and I have an old school jam box with an auxiliary cable to run that and make it loud and really exciting. But again, we need a um, generator to be able to run the power to those things. So if you have an additional small generator that would be kind of quiet that we could use to run our music, that would really be a lot of fun for our racers. And a couple of years ago, I borrowed one of those air dancer, sky dancers that has the face on it and the 
the arms would go up and down and we put that up on the top of the overpass at cross timbers so that the racers could see us coming from a distance and would just give them that encouragement that they've almost made it to us that was really exciting if you have something like that know of something like that um, it would take a generator to run that as well and i'm going to continue to see if i can locate one because i think that would be a whole lot of fun uh, for our racers coming over that moment in the race all right so i think that I have covered everything, but you can see here that we're going to be reaching out to um, some veterans and some new parents alike uh, to get these areas station leaders assigned, and then we will plug in families together in certain areas as you have sent requests, and I'll plug those in as well. And if you're willing to step on up and try being a section leader and you think, man, I got this, don't worry, I would love to have you. You can let me know by email as well. And if you have not had a chance to write back and request your location to serve, then you can go ahead and email Mary or myself and we'll get you assigned. And then everyone will see all of the assignments before we get to our race day. You will get a, an Ironman volunteer t-shirt, but sometimes I don't get those until the very last minute. And so, and we don't always get a perfect round of sizing. So instead, we prefer to do our event in our Boy Scout Class B shirt. So make sure that you have your red shirt ready for the day. Adults alike, everybody in their red shirt. Mary and myself will have to wear our Iron Man captain's gear so that Iron Man staff can, can pick us out of the crowd and we can do all of those administrative pieces that are required for the day. Um, but everybody else will be in class B. And then at the next scout meeting, we'll be sure that everyone has their volunteer t-shirt, okay? Now, the last thing that I will mention out of all of this is if any of you are unable to work the morning, but you would love to volunteer in the afternoon or evening with environmental. You'll remember from my email that Phil Schull, who was a former committee chair at 491, he is in charge of all of the environmental division of Iron Man, which really is code for the trash guy. And they have needs during the week on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then even Saturday afternoon and evening, um, all the way until the woodlands is spotless after the race is over. And sometimes that can go well into the morning hours. But if we had a whole patrol that wanted to jump in there and try it or do it, do that together, it would make it go by so much faster. It would be great. Um, it is a rite of passage. Ethan and I have done it and I've known several of our scouts who have gone and done that trash pickup. And it's so vital to keeping a good standing with the community so this race can continue year after year. All right, well, I think that's all that I have for today. Uh, thanks for listening to my little video here and I hope, I hope that you have uh, enjoyed um, getting plugged in here in Troop 491 and I look forward to meeting you if I haven't already on race day and hopefully we'll get some practice in during the month of April on some of our Monday nights. But I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye guys.